shorter on now and just tell you okay. what I was thinking. You know, this okay. is going to be like you know about 600 words or 800 words, so about a typewritten page. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, we usually in the picture and get a sound bite. Okay. And um, you know, you got to film. It's kind of a couple of years old, so that's not like breaking news. But you know, we approach it from the um, perspective like we talk, but um, you know. You're a blind filmmaker, uh, never actually saw your own film. And uh, talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts and challenges of making it without uh, eyesight. And then, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out if this has ever been done before right. prior to you. I know there's uh, quite a few blind photographers, but usually they have some kind of vision. Yeah, I have zero vision, number one. Number two, um, I think it was about 17, 18 months ago that we actually finished the first version of the movie. But we have been tweaking it over the last year to make it a little better. You know, and we had to cut a few things. So it's not like it was just done two years ago. So uh, I think December uh, 17 was when we were officially done with the first version. And we showed it uh, in uh, the Unity East Side uh, January a year ago uh, in Tallahassee, Florida. That's the first time we showed it. Um, and then we showed it since here a couple times and St. Petersburg a couple times and Tallahassee a couple more times. Uh, Washington, D.C. we showed it in June, June 20th last year. So we've shown it about 10, 11 times, but it, you know, it, it is not... Uh, it's still going to be a ways before it's two years old, so just for the record. Okay, um, and you're distributing this on DVD? We're showing it. We're not distributing it at this point. We're looking for a distributor. We're looking for a national uh, organization that wants to back it. We're looking for a celebrity who would like to endorse it because with celebrity status and endorsement, we heard that we can get into HBO and Netflix. Uh, and PBS, so we still need a few things, uh, and we're still asking for donations because we still got to keep the you know the utility bills coming in for you know the people that I've hired to do a lot of the work. You know the website, Paula, you know the work that she's been doing, public relations, um, <clears throat> Mike, my cinematographer, Allison, another woman who works with me on the Facebook stuff. So there are bills, but um, we did raise. Uh, a nice amount of close to $35,000 to actually make the movie. And, um, you know, that in itself was uh, no guarantee, but it worked out. So. so that was your budget? We didn't have a budget. Actually, I got $13,000 when we first did a, 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 a not-for-profit uh, fundraiser company called Hatch Fund. And we raised $13,000 with them. And that got us started. Once we got started, then people saw that I was serious about making a movie. Because they, they thought a blind man making a movie was a nice story, but you know, nothing, they didn't believe it. So once I got the first 11 minutes in the can, so to speak, and we showed that, then we started getting more donations coming in. But the total at this point was about $35,000. And if you know anything about movies, everybody says, it's not a lot of money in making a movie. So I didn't, I didn't make a dime. It wasn't me. To, I'm not doing this to make money. I'm trying to make a difference. So I didn't take any money. But as far as you know, you never heard of another blind filmmaker? The only... No, not a filmmaker. I, I remember there was a guy named Tom Sullivan, 20, maybe 30 years ago, who was in a movie that I think he... Uh, it was about his life. But he didn't make the movie. But you could check that out down the road, like 30 years ago. Tom Sullivan, I think is his name. What you could, how was it? If you could see what I hear, I think was the name of it. Um, but it was like, I don't know, it was just kind of a bit of a slapstick movie. And I've, I've checked out a lot of people who have been with Outside who have done things, people who have written books. Uh, a lot of them are... Uh, you know, articulate about pointing out the burden of being blind. <laughs> and 
uh, for me, that was not in, an interesting angle. What I wanted to do, I wanted to make a movie that was going to try to really help. And it wasn't to focus on my blindness, but it was to focus on the possibilities of people with disabilities. Because right now the military does not honor those with disabilities in a way that I think that they could. There's a logic to the movie, and when you see the movie, you'll see the logic to what I'm trying to accomplish here. Are they somehow exempt from the ADA? Well, uh, obviously they're not being sued for not being in compliance with the ADA. And uh, they, you know, there are all kinds of little subtleties about who's eligible and who's not to be compliant to these things. I do know that, I, w I stated in the movie that every business and corporation in America is compliant to the ADA, except the United States military. So, uh, but, but the ADA has legal things that might not work to uh, uh, sustain a healthy, vibrant military. But half the jobs in the military are done on computers these days. And you'll see in the movie again, there are people who are disabled who are, have stayed in the military after their disability and they did just fine. So there's no rational reason why they can't have a policy to, uh, you know, if you're highly functioning after your disability, whether you got it in combat or on the job, something happened, you should still have the option of remaining if you are lucid, still highly functioning, if you wanted a chance of a career of dignity instead of being forced out. Right now that, that doesn't exist. But again, you'll see the movie and the, it, there's a lot more about that in the movie. Yeah, I haven't seen the movie yet, and I've seen clips of it, I think, on YouTube, so it's uh, mostly interviews. Well, uh, we have four main characters. I'm in the movie, but I'm not a main character. Uh, two people who are main characters are going to be on the Q&A with me after the movie, Bill, Bill Forte and Larry Winters. You just met Larry before. He's standing there with me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Tony Forte lives in North Carolina, and so does Ivan Castro. They're the other... Uh, two characters in the movie. And, um, but we did other interviews, and uh, we interviewed Chris Gibson. You might know Chris Gibson. He used yeah, to be the congressman. congressman yeah. He's in the movie. Uh, we have uh, uh, Randy Lewis, who is a senior vice president, former senior vice president of uh, uh, Walgreens. He's in the movie. Um, you know, we have Tammy Duckworth. He's in the movie. Uh, you know, she's the center of Illinois. So, Anyway, you ask questions, otherwise I'll just keep rambling, so. Okay, so when you say characters, they're, they're themselves. They, they are themselves. They're, they're actually interview subjects. Yes. It's, it's a non-fiction film. Non-fiction, documentary all the way. And um, uh, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, what it was like um, making, making the film yeah. Uh, without eyesight, how, how did you accomplish that? How did you overcome well, the challenge? Well, first of all, I'll give you a little background on who I am. I have written three books, two screenplays, uh, a five. I created a five-CD program called Beginning Yoga for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and I founded uh, and was CEO of a holistic learning center in Tallahassee, Florida, for seven years. So I have done a lot of things. I have always had. You know, I had 20-20 vision for like 20 years, so I, I still can visualize and I have been told that I am a bit of a visionary because I may not have sight. I can't see the paper there or your face, but I, I, I have an idea of, you know, and I can seem to manifest these ideas into reality if I am so passionate, you know, toward focusing on something. When I focus on something, I tend to get things done. And um, I think I learned that, you know, from my parents. They were old school, and I learned a lot of discipline as a child. So I'm using it now in a good way. Well, I guess this might sound a little um, naive. I wasn't there when you made the film, but was there like a, you know, you directed and produced the film, so did you like sit in the chair and say action? Or? Okay. Uh, I was there for a number of the interviews where I interviewed the people and Mike, the cinematographer, Mike Nelson, who's here, uh, he did the filming of that, the audio and the visual of it. Um, 
I sent Mike to California to do a couple interviews, and I sent him to North Carolina and Massachusetts for a couple more interviews. I gave him the questions. He just asked the questions and rolled the, rolled the camera. Um, when Mike came home, or he, he was done with an interview, he would put a, a flash drive, an audio version of the interview, 30, 40 minute interview, on my computer. I, I have a, a voice activated compu computer so I can, uh, you know, uh, I can show you that at some point if you want, uh, how I write books and screenplays and things like that. Because, uh, you know, the software is pretty amazing these days for people who are blind. So with each interview, I would have it as an audio. And I would listen to it a number of times until I found clips in the interview from four minutes and 36 seconds to six minutes and 12 seconds. And I, can, I would write that down on, on a, an email and say, Mike, here are six clips from this 40 minute interview. These are the ones that I want from this guy we just interviewed. Because I think these are the best. He would then uh, take those times and put them on a timeline uh, with the audio and the video. I'd come over and we'd work in his studio where I had the audio that I wanted and he would describe to me what was the video there, if we needed to change it at all, if we needed to you know, increase the volume or you know, have softer cuts, you know, uh, fade away or you know, uh, jump cut, all that kind of stuff. I learned a lot about making a movie that I didn't know before, but I'm smart and you know, give me a little information and I can go a long way with it. So we did, I did that with every interview. And it was a lot of work, but I loved it. And then I'd come back uh, into Mike's studio and we'd work on it together. He knew nothing about the issue and about blindness, and I knew nothing about you know, photography. He, he's a really well-respected photo pho photographer in uh, Saudi Arabia. So we were so, it was a learning experience for both of us to work together, and we did great. Um, my partner is an artist, and she's assistant director in the movie, because I needed to know that every scene was visually impeccable before I would okay it. And if she said it was okay, I knew it was okay. Because she was very demanding about her visuals stuff. So I, I, you know, I had a bunch of people around me, but I kind of was in charge of the whole thing. Um, is this good? Is this what you want? This kind of stuff? Yeah, it's great. It's, uh, okay. it's, you know. Once we had it on, once we had enough of the different uh, selects on the timeline, then I started deciding at home. I had them all listed and I knew what they were and then I would figure out this clip with Larry needs to be right after this clip with Bill and then after this clip with Tony. And then we'd come back to Mike's studio, we'd put them together and I'd see how they would fit together. So that was the whole process, you follow? Yes, and, I do. Yeah. Uh, and then at some point uh, we would have a couple of things on the screen and, and uh, like quotes. And then we needed to find some visuals to back up the quotes. So I'd say, let's talk about it with Mike or with Charlotte, and then like he, Mike would find something on the uh, internet, put, put it in. If Charlotte liked it, it was checked off, you know, that kind of thing. It was a process. But I was always in charge of everything from soup to nuts. Um, uh, at one point, we were working with uh, Molly Mason and Jay Unker. Are you familiar with them? They're wonderful musicians, and uh, they, I wanted their music in the movie, and they gave us four or five different songs that we could use for the movie. So uh, we worked on that stuff, and, uh, and then Molly and Jay came over one time because they were not happy with the way it was sitting, so they made a number of changes so it would fit better. And, and they know what they're doing. You know, I'm a musician, but they're all really sharp, and it was their music. 90% of what they said we just went along with. But there was one place where I said, no, I like what this works for me. And, you know, I, I ruled there basically because it's my movie. And I'll just tell you the clip was the music that you'll hear when uh, uh, 
Randy Lewis is talking about all the other businesses that have hired disabled people. The music is up tempo there, and I think it fits perfectly. So I'm still very happy with that decision, even though I was defying Molly and Jay, which is like uh, like defying the music gods. <laughs> but I had a, a ball doing it, and I got to connect with these wonderful people, like like the song that you'll hear in the movie. I wrote it, and the last four minutes of the movie. Uh, you'll see something on the screen. The, mood, the song is being played. And I went into the uh, sound studio with five professional musicians and we worked together and made this wonderful professional version of the song, a veteran's anthem. And I wrote that to try to help veterans focus on life and not death. So, you know, uh, it was really a labor of love, but it expanded me every day that I was working on it because I, I had to open up to areas that I hadn't thought about, you know, as a blind person. But I will say that when I had sight, I was very much into the movies, you know, uh, and you'll get a kick out of this. James Cagney was one of my favorite actors. Did you ever see any of his movies? Might be a little before my time. Okay. Well, well, the first... I probably did, but... Um, you'll see it in the first three minutes of the movie, because there's one movie he made, Yankee Doodle Dandy. I saw it a hundred times. Every time I see it, it, I cry, and I feel like a lot of my life is uh, kind of like the life that the character that George that, that he played in that movie emulated, you know. So uh, I'm just doing my best, and um, I put all these things together: love, my love of movies, my love of you know, what Yankee Doodle Dandy, that movie stood for, and James Cagney, one of my famous actors. Uh, and and, and the, the disgust I felt when I realized that, you know, every day, 22 veterans, give or take a couple, are still finding reasons to take their own lives. It's just not okay. And it feels like an ongoing tragedy that no one's doing anything about. Now they're just starting to do something about it. Maybe it's because of my movie, maybe not. I don't know, I don't care. I do care that the military makes the changes that I'm asking for in the movie, and if they do, I strongly believe that the suicide rate will be reduced. How much? I don't know. But I do think it will help. So, um, How many disabled vets are there right now who are still alive? <laughs> that are alive? Jeez, I have no idea. Right now, I believe there are 30 million veterans in the country. And um, I, the, the disability, they do uh, like, you know, 30%, 50%, 80%, 100%. So there are a lot of people who have some disability. There's much less that are 100% disabled. I lost my sight completely. I'm 100% disabled. And I get a pension every month because of my, you know, loss of sight. And it's given me a little bit of a freedom to not have to rush out to try to pay my bills every month. So I have some flexibility, and this is my best effort to try to give back and serve. So. Okay, so this was like a, a natural disease that happened while you were in the service? Yes. And I lost my vision from glaucoma officially, but it was like I had uh, cataracts, glaucoma, and some d disease called uveitis. And... Uh, it, you know, I have a website, whycan'twecerve.com. If you ever want to check that out, there's all kinds of stuff about me. If, after this, if you have any more questions, feel free to call me. I, I'll, I'll fill you in on stuff. But, but it took about seven... I, when I got out, I still had a lot of vision. But within a couple of years, I was totally blind. And for seven years, I didn't know which way it was up. I didn't know how to live a life without sight. And, you know, I, I fell in... I got lucky. You know, but looking back, you know, uh, a lot of guys who go through these disabled situations, they don't, you know, they don't, fall, they don't get lucky, and a lot of them take their lives. So I'm trying to help that. Okay, um, that's great. We got about ten minutes till showtime. Here. Okay, so feel free to ask any more after the movie if you want, or tomorrow or the next day, call me, whatever you want to Bill do. Bill Forte standing next to you. I think he wants to say hello. Or hey, Bill. Hey, Bill. You know, you know Rob? Robbie? We've met, uh, We've met. Bill always does the parades. I do that story every year. And um, 